Sounds good. Hello, YouTube. Hello, Facebook. We're going to start the program now. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our, uh, I guess we call it our Greatest Generation Live program. I'm Todd DePastino. This is the Veterans Breakfast Club. With me is Glenn Flickinger. Hello, Glenn. Hello, Todd. Um, we, you know, we at the Veterans Breakfast Club, we've been doing this for 15 years. We're a nonprofit based in Pittsburgh where we have veterans come on and share stories. We do it in person at uh, in, in person events here, mostly in Western Pennsylvania. We also do them online and we have a, a Monday night program we call the BBC Happy Hour. This program on Thursday night, we this is an ongoing conversation about the Apple TV Plus series, Masters of the Air. Glenn Flickinger is our house expert on all things World War II, especially the air war over Europe. And uh, so we've been dedicating these Thursday nights in January, February, and March to the air war over Europe. We're continuing that conversation. I'm the executive director of the Veterans Breakfast Club. I'll be the wingman assisting Glenn tonight. My name is Todd DePastino. And the Veterans Breakfast Club, as I said, is a nonprofit that has been in business for 15 years. We've had thousands of veterans come on and share thousands of stories to connect, heal, educate, and inspire we get our story shared through online programs like this in person and also through our publications, such as our BBC magazine, which we publish every quarter. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. You could check out all the programming that we do and become a member of the Veterans Breakfast Club on our website, veteransbreakfastclub.org. And now I'm gonna throw it to Glenn. Glenn, thank you for hosting this program. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Todd. Uh, so here we go again. Um, those of you who might be might be new, uh, I'm Glenn Flickinger, as stated before, and I've had the great privilege of hosting these Greatest Generation Live programs now for several years, uh, all things World War II. But for the last couple of months now, we're focusing on Masters of the Air for obvious reasons. Uh, every Thursday night, we, we do this with a historical expert, and we were fortunate enough, a veteran of the 8th Air Force is on. And tonight we have both a veteran of the 8th Air Force and an expert uh, author. And let me uh, first uh, welcome Lucky Luckadoo. John, John Lucky Luckadoo, say hello, please. Okay. I'll ask John, I'll ask Lucky to unmute. Okay, can you hear me? You Great. Thank you so much, Lucky, for uh, for being on again. This now makes uh, several guest appearances. We're so fortunate that you're so generous with your time and knowledge. Thank you, Glad. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be anywhere, but I'm glad to be here. <laughs> We're glad to have you here, for sure, Lucky. Uh, I'm really happy that uh, Lucky's on. We, I was emailing him a question or two, and uh, about this latest episode uh, of Masters of the Air on Apple TV. And uh, he's, why don't I just come on and express my thoughts? So I'm going to get to Lucky in a couple of minutes. But let me also uh, introduce our uh, expert tonight, and that's Steve Snyder. Steve, say hello. Hello there. Thanks for having me on, Glenn and Todd. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, especially uh, honored to be here with, uh, with Lucky. He's the expert, not me. <laughs> yeah, and he's kind of the superstar, Steve. I hate to say it. I mean, well, uh, I, I I know Lucky. I've uh, been with uh, seen his presentations, and Lucky is an absolute rock star. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Steve, you're 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 entirely too too generous. <laughs> oh no! Well, it's so good awesome. to see you again. Good to see you, absolutely. 
our members might remember we had Steve on. Well, he's been on several times in the last few weeks as one of our sort of panel of uh, contributors. Uh, but a couple of years ago, year and a half ago, I can't remember the exact date, Steve, we had Steve on and we spent the whole time on his book, Shot Down, which is the story of his father, uh, Howard Snyder, who, who was shot down in February of 1944. Is that right? Uh, do I have that Correct. date, Steve? Feb February 8th, 44. February 8th, 44. So you just had the uh, anniversary of that, uh, obviously, just a few a couple weeks ago. When you were on yes. that, February 8th, you were on that night. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so uh, Steve's book is excellent. Highly recommend it. Um, he's made a, a little documentary of uh, that experience that we're going to show you a little bit later tonight. So um, we'll, we'll get to Steve maybe in 20 minutes or so, depending on the first part of the discussion. OK, um, so uh, we didn't do a survey as we've done uh, the previous four or five weeks. But the survey has shown that it's about 50-50 in terms of those of you who have seen the epi latest episode and those who have not. So we want to respect the point that we, we've been doing this program with the idea that you don't have to watch the Apple TV series to understand the program and to be a participant in the program. So let me just do a quick summary of uh, uh, the uh, mission to Munster, which is the name of the last episode. Ah, before I do that, uh, I'd like to recognize my good friend from a lifetime friend, Sam Kearns, from Lake Frederick History Club down near Winchester, Virginia. Can you unmute Sam for a moment, uh, Todd? Sam, are you there? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm there. Yeah. Well, I just want to th thank Sam in public, and there may be some of the members from Lake Frederick History Club. I was there last Monday. And I delivered a presentation on the history of the air war in Europe, focusing on masters of the air and the eighth air force. Sam thought there might be a dozen people there when I was on my way down. <laughs> we ended up with 62. Yeah. And, yeah. You did uh, a great job. They're still talking about it. And uh, in fact, one of our members father was in the Luftwaffe. He was, uh, yes. uh, he might be on tonight, Hans. So uh, we have a lot of people. Uh, this is a retirement village about an hour out of BC and a lot of uh, veterans and, uh, and fathers who were like my father was in, and many of your fathers were in the war. So yeah, thanks for coming down, Glenn. Appreciate all that everyone does here. And we really look forward to tonight's presentation with Lucky. Okay. Well, a warm shout out, a shout out <laughs> to everybody there at Lake Frederick. It was really a fun uh, couple of hours being there. And I just wanted to welcome anybody from that group that's on the uh, program tonight. Okay, so, so let me just summarize very quickly the mission to Munster for those of you who did not see it. This, this is the famous, well-known mission to Munster uh, by the 8th Air Force with, of course, the 100th Bomber Group involved, along with several other bomber groups. It takes place on a Sunday, which is kind of key to one of the points of this discussion, October 10th. 274 uh, heavies, heavy bombers set, set out, 236 got to the target dropped their bombs, 30 B-17s were lost. Two men were killed in action in the air, 18 wounded in action, and 306 missing in action. This was thought that it was going to be a relatively straightforward, simple mission. If you look at the map, Munster is just a little bit inside the German border. It was a relatively short mission in terms of hours flown, uh, but it turned out to be a murderous mission. Um, partly because the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, uh, and Hermann Göring had decided to make a stand. And the thought is, it's reflected in Don Miller's book, the thought is that this might be the first time the Luftwaffe is successful in turning back an 8th Air Force raid, which they were not successful. and They never were successful in turning back a raid. Uh, but uh, there were hundreds of Luftwaffe fighters in the air as they reached Munster, and, and it was a carnage for those of you that have seen it. It was especially a carnage for the 100th Bomber Group. This is where it earns its moniker, uh, the Bloody 100th, without a doubt. I'm not sure exactly when that term comes into play. Maybe Lucky can tell us a little bit later. But uh, uh, of, of, of the planes that are sent up by the 100th, and this is the third day, three missions in a row, so the, all the bomber groups are somewhat depleted. The eighth, the hundredth is heavily depleted in terms of how many planes they can put in the air. 
I think it was 17 planes put in the air. Several had to turn back due to um, uh, mechanical problems aboard it. Um, uh, but out of all of those planes, I believe 11 or 12 hit the target. Only one plane survives. One plane, and that's the now famous Rosie Rosenthal's plane uh, that survives and comes back. And it had wounded and in, uh, in a, wounded in action on board. Um, so the hundred bomber group is just decimated there. Uh, one of the errors, and I know Colin Heaton is on tonight. Colin, hello. Uh, one of the errors that's in the movie, and they do this to dramatize, I think, the point, which is fine. But I just want to point out that how that it was inaccurate in the in the episode as they cross the English Channel. There's chatter among the heavy bombers that okay, the fighters' protection, the escort is turning back just as they're about to reach the European coast. That really is was not the way it happened. They had 216 P-47s escorting them that day, and they were able to escort them almost to the target. They were at the maximum of their range and had to turn back. And that's when the Luftwaffe then attacked in those heavy, heavy numbers, hundreds of numbers. Colin, any comment on that? Do we have that right? Yeah, Adolf Gallen told his pilots uh, he would send up a reconnaissance flight. There would be like two or three uh, aircraft from each uh, Geschwader who would basically orbit the area once radar picked up the bombers. And then once those fighters who refrained from attacking the escort fighters, once they saw, you know, that those aircraft drop tanks or, or turn back, that's when they radioed down, you know, you know, Angriff Auka, Angriff Auka, attack, attack, attack. And that's when all the pilots would take off. So it was coordinated. It was very well coordinated. And they expected that to happen. And that's why Galland organized it that way. And, and, and we didn't expect such a heavy resistance. Is that accurate? Yeah, there were 326 fighters deployed, 250 contacts in three waves, and I believe there were 72 German pilots who claimed victories, uh, of which we know that that was an over overshoot. But we know that, well, I interviewed three of the pilots who scored B-17 kills on that particular mission. Uh, and I was dismayed to not to see the 190s depicted they were flying, but I did see the 109 that was accurately depicted, so... So uh, the other element of this, and this is where I was uh, uh, emailing with Lucky and talked to Steve about this, that's in the episode, is that this is the first mission by the 8th Air Force where the target is the city. It's the city center. And there's been, and it's covered in Don's book, Don Miller's book, and, and, and the other book, Frank Murphy, Luck of the Draw. It's covered in depth in there. We don't need to go into it all. There have been some controversy as to what exactly was the target. Um, some said that the target was the cathedral in the center of the city, which was very close to the railroad marshalling yards. Some said that the target was the center of the city. Um, irregardless, this was the first time that the 8th Air Force participated in a bombing that would they knew the intent was to create civilian casualties. Up until that time, they had not. Of course, the RAF and Bomber Command at night, that's that's all they did was was that kind of bombing. Uh, so then it's a pretty tense scene in 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 the episode uh, as the uh, officers are getting dressed in their ready room or whatever it was called. And uh, there's some mumbling about this element of, of the mission. And Frank Murphy is the one who says, you know, geez, do we really want to be bombing you know, uh, moms and kids. These people are going to be coming out of church, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's a dramatic moment that I think the screenwriter created for Egan, Major Egan, whose friend Clevin had been shot down a couple of days before, and he didn't know whether Clevin was alive or not, uh, was out for revenge. And there's this very heavy exchange uh, between the two of them. And Murphy backs down and says, yes, of course, I'll go on the mission. Just again, it's a dramatization. It really did happen, but it didn't happen with Frank Murphy and Egan. In Don Miller's book, he covers it very clearly. It happened in another bomber squadron. I think it was the 95th bomber bomber group. I'm sorry, 95th bomber group um, with two other names and several other people. Um, uh, one of who one of those uh, characters, uh, 
uh, one of those actual people was the son of a of a Protestant minister who had grown up very heavy, very religious, and you know expressed his concerns about bombing near a church, and that's the scene that they transpose from the reality to the hundredth bomber group. Okay, doesn't change the point. The point is uh, there was this uh, concern about bombing uh, city the, a city center and having a heavy impact on civilians. They carry out the mission with great success, despite all the casualties. It, it's a very successful, accurate bombing that day, uh, despite the resistance. So again, another courageous, courageous mission uh, by the 8th Air Force and particularly the 100th. So that's what I wanted to get some, some discussion going uh, from Steve and from Lucky. Um, Steve, I think you have a paragraph in your book where you address this. Uh, right. Yes, I do. It's only a few sentences. Could you read that as a point for us to try to see if we can have a discussion about this? Sure, sure. Um, making things worse was the fact that the raid to Munster was the first time that the U.S. specifically went out to bomb civilians, targeting the front steps of the cathedral on a Sunday during Mass. Many crews, especially Catholics, had serious problems bombing a house of God and questioned their orders. Although the British RAF bombed towns, doing so far for the U.S. was a shockingly different concept for many crew members. And we, we talked about this, if your father ever really had a discussion with you about this, or had you heard anything about this from other veterans that you've interviewed? Uh, my dad never really uh, mentioned that to me, no. And... Uh, yeah, you know, there's always been debates that, you know, I've been involved with, you know, on like, you know, bombing of Dresden and other German cities, you know, you know, the pros and cons of, of, of doing that. And, you know, there's just like the, the series depicted in that one scene that you mentioned, you know, there are some airmen that were really bothered by it, but some of them said, hey, they're the ones who started this. They deserve it. And I have no pity on them whatsoever. Uh, there, there's a line in in uh, Don's book. I'll just paraphrase it: uh, uh, that an airman from another bomber squadron uh, said to Don Miller as an interview. He said, "This was our third mission in a row in three days. We were so tired, we didn't know, we didn't care where we were going. We just wanted to get the job done and get back." With that, let's ask the man who was there, uh, Lucky. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, you come in to the 100th Bomb Squadron shortly after, the, the, a little bit after the mission to Munster. Um, was this a discussion at all while you were there with you or your fellow airmen? Oh, it certainly was, Glenn. Hmm. Uh, as airmen, we did not know ever what the real strategy or uh, purpose behind our bombing was. We were totally ignorant of the fact that the British were so adamant against our daylight bombing strategy uh, that they did everything in their power to dissuade us. And in one case, they even uh, uh, noted that um, Sir Arthur Harris, the head of the RAF bomber force pleaded with Prime Minister Churchill to plead with President Roosevelt to order the 8th Air Force to stand down from daylight bombing. Now, one of the important things about that you should uh, uh, remember in context about this particular episode and Masters of the Air, is that this was, of course, the third raid in successive days of what we call Black Week, Black, yes. which began on October the, the 8th of 1943, and which I participated in. You were there. Ah, I, 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 I was you. not only there, I was the sole surviving element leader in the formation after we left the target 
we had sh uh, they had shot down 12 out of our 18 airplanes in a 100 bomb group on the bomb run and i was the sole element leader i was uh, an instructor pilot this was my first mission after my original crew had finished up their first and uh, uh, quickest tour of a combat mission, a uh, combat tour uh, in the 8th Air Force. 89 days. That was Glenn Dye's crew, number 25. And I had flown 21 of those missions with them. So I still had four to fly. And they went back home uh, and were rotated back to the States, but I remained with the group. And when I landed, because the operations officer of my squadron, the 351st Squadron, had been shot down directly in front of me, having been rammed by an, M uh, an FW-190 and exploding, I knew that he wasn't coming back. When I landed, the squadron commander came up to me and said, Lucky, where in the world is Barker? And I said, Barker's not coming home. I saw them explode. And he said, all right, then you are the new operations officer of this squadron. So at 21 years of age, a second lieutenant still, I became a ground duty officer in addition to flying combat missions. And I was flying as the uh, command pilot with a brand new crew who was on their third mission. And uh, on the Bremen raid, and this was the first time in all of our experiences, I had 21 missions behind me at this stage. We had never seen the flak resistance that was thrown up at us on Bremen. It was so thick that somebody joked that they could load iron their wheels and taxi on it. But not only was this a rare occasion, because usually when we turned on the bomb run, the Luftwaffe would hold back and let the enemy aircraft fire damage us sufficiently to force us out of the formation. And then once we were by ourselves, they could pick us off at leisure. This didn't happen on October the 8th. The Luftwaffe flew through their own flak. We'd never seen that before. They were just as much in danger of being shot down by friendly fire as we were by enemy fire, but that was the kind of resistance that they threw up on, uh, on, on Bremen. The next day we went to, uh, our group flew to uh, Marienburg, uh, where we lost nine out of the 18 airplanes. And the third day we were briefed to go to Munster, and this is the one that John Egan led in uh, revenge for his uh, uh, a buddy, Buck Cleveland, having been shot down on the mission I was on uh, to Bremen. And uh, <clears throat> it was the first time that in the briefing, they admitted that the target was civilian. They did... Uh, point out that the target actually was the marshalling yards, but the cathedral was nearby, and that we were going to bomb at high noon, just as the parishioners would be leaving church, and that they were collateral damage, they were legitimate targets, because they supported the Third Reich, and they were the workers for the rail yards and, and uh, for the factories. Uh, and, and Egan was ecstatic about that aspect of that raid. I remember him jumping up in the briefing room and saying, yay, 
we'll go get the bastards. And that was his attitude when he took off. Did you hear any negative comments in that briefing room or subsequently about the, this issue? I don't recall hearing the negative comments, but I know that there were negative feelings. Hmm. And some of us had been, most of us had been brought up with a Judo-Christian uh, edict that, uh, you know, we lived by the Ten Commandments. The sixth was thou shalt not kill. Well, hell, in, in, in combat, you kill or be killed. That's the reality of war. And so, you know, we are, each individual had our own demons, and we, we had to uh, reconcile within our own consciousness our, not only our mortality, but also our morality. Well, those were things that we didn't have time to dwell on. If we did, we cracked up and we were useless. Yeah. But we were flying every damn day that we could fly. And on that monster raid, when I stood on the tower that day as an operations officer, trying to count the returnees, and the only one was Rosie Rosenthal, the single survivor, made it back on two engines, yeah. uh, barely. And they pretty well uh, um, depict what his crew went through uh, on that mission. Rosie was, was really one of our heroes because he not only flew one tour, but he flew over two tours. Yeah. Yeah. He was a lawyer from New York. Uh, and he was Jewish, and he was there to fight. And when he got shot down, each time he came back, and he, even though he was not supposed to ever fly again in combat because there was a price on his head, he said, give me a crew and give me an airplane. I'm here to fight the war. And they did. So he flew 52 missions, and in those days, that was just miraculous. But I see how they're going to depict him in the balance of the Apple TV shows. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but the series, the series is is, um, uh, and I know in talking with Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg both that they were adamant about being as accurate and as factual as they could be. But then in spite of all of that, their film writers did sneak in a few uh, inaccuracies that are not really consequential to the, uh, the story or, or the acts that were performed of courage and heroism that individuals and crews exhibited uh, while they were serving in the, in the European Air War. But um, they, uh, nevertheless, were not uh, totally true and accurate. And it, it's understandable. Again, I think you used the right phrase there, Lucky. The inaccuracies they show are not consequential. They're just done for dramatic effect to make the story a little tighter. Uh, otherwise, the darn thing would go on for hours and hours and hours and nobody would watch it. Let me ask uh, uh, the audience, if 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 you would, Lucky, are, are there questions from the audience of either Steve or Lucky uh, about this point or any other point? Just raise your hand. Anything in the chat room, Todd? There's a, there's chatter in the in the chat room. Greg Yost put it that um, Bomber Harris's tactics were controversial, even at the time. I asked whether Americans on the home front were aware of this debate and uh, these questions, because um, I don't recall anything in the home front. No. Okay. Colin says no. It was not debated on the home front. I just have chills hearing Lucky talk. I mean, it's just remarkable. 
that we have somebody who was there who was depicted. Rona. Let's see. Good to see you, Rona. Um, thanks, Todd. I, I will say my father was a fighter pilot and a bomber escort out of North Africa during the war. And I was very fortunate. He lived to be 97. And I interviewed him. And I just apropos the same comments, uh, just a quick sentence. When I talked to him about his um, uh, uh, his missions, he said um, it was my philosophy. We're talking about targets of opportunity. When they finished escorting the bombers and had to turn back, he said it was my philosophy. I don't know that it was the overall philosophy, but mine was that anything that moved, automobiles, cars, trains. He said trains were a favorite target because they blew up nicely. They were unusually freight. They were usually freight trains carrying armaments, so that was a good target. Targets of opportunity, anything that moved. And he sort of jokingly, I mean, sort of macabre, said hospitals, orphanages, schools were targets of opportunity. Now he did, he did retract and said we joked about that, meaning the guys would talk about hitting orphanages or hospitals, but we didn't really. He said if you saw a red cross, you respected that did not attack. But same same thing for the for the. Uh, fighter pilots. Thank you, Rona. Yeah, I was hoping Joe Peterburs and Ed Cottrell would be on tonight, but both happen not to be on. They're both traveling because uh, it would have been interesting to get their perspective as fighter pilots, which um, uh, obviously a little different than being in the heavy bombers because they're up close to these targets versus four or five miles high. Is there is anybody else would like to offer a comment or Yes, we have Jeff Chivers. Hello, Jeff. It, although you look like Joe. No, it is Joe because my son, <laughs> got, my son say, got on the system and put his name in instead of mine. Anyway. I was going to say, do you have a twin? Who, you know, <laughs> good to see you, Joe. Good to see you. By the way, Lucky, thank you. I, I've got to tell you, listening to you is is absolutely, I don't know, it's just inspirational. It's wonderful. So thank you so much. And I and I got to tell you, when I uh, when I watch uh, Masters of the Air. And having read some books also about it, and there are a number of people who are here this evening that have experienced combat and have experienced uh, terrible situations. But I really, I wanted to ask you, what, what is it? How, how did you and the others muster the courage each and every day to get back into those planes? I don't, I really, I don't know how you did it. And if you can share that, what you remember about it, I, I sure would, I sure would appreciate that. We don't either. To be absolutely frank with you, I don't know how the hell we did it. Yeah. Uh, I just know that our focus was so riveted on completing the job and doing what we were there to do. And we, we didn't have time to grieve. We had no funerals. We would had no memorials for any of the crews that went down. We didn't have time to grieve. We just had to turn around and get back in that airplane the next day and go up. Uh, and if you dwelt on what your, your chances of coming home again and having supper and going to and, and crawling in clean sheets, uh, you'd crack up. And some did. There were some who who the strain and the the uh, the the mental turmoil that they went through or we went through daily and nightly. Our nightmares were something that we had to contend with. Uh, was was something that was pretty overpowering or could be. But you had we all had our demons. We all had our talismans we all had our superstitions as to what we could do to survive uh, but it was a matter of survival and it was a matter of um, uh, realizing that we were up against a formidable enemy uh, that had to be vanquished and so we just had a job we had to do and we we did it to the best of our ability. Thank you, Lucky. Thank you, Lucky. If you survived it, you were just damn lucky. 
Hey, it sounds like the title of a book to me, Lucky. I... <laughs> Listen, uh, Lucky, if I could ask you to just uh, 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 hold on here for a little bit, I'd like to turn to our guest, Steve Snyder, and the story of his father. I'm not sure how much you know about uh, his father's experience of being shot down. Uh, I'm right here for it. Okay. And I, I know some of our audience is, some are not. Um, Steve, uh, how would we like to start? Would you like me to start with this uh, uh, documentary that you put together? Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. Okay. It, it does. It, it, I've watched it a couple of times now. It's 12 minutes or so, and it just very nicely depicts, um, you know, what happened to Steve's father, Howard. So and let's... Glenn, remember to tick those little boxes at the bottom when you share screen. Okay. Share sound. Yep. Optimize video clip. That's Got it. it. I Got it this time. Okay. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. You doing okay? Yep. Great. Like most World War II veterans, my dad didn't talk a lot about the war. Growing up, I knew the basics. I knew it was a B-17 pilot. His plane was named the Susan Ruth. He flew bombing missions over occupied Europe. And on February 8th of 1944, his plane was shot down. I had a wonderful relationship with my father. He was a tough guy, you know, kind of a no-nonsense guy. We compared him to John Wayne. He was that type of character. My parents grew up in an area with tough times. They went through the Depression, and they were tough people as a result of that. World War II came along, and there was no other event in history that affected more people. When Japan bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7th, the country rallied. They believed in their cause, and they were willing to sacrifice all to achieve victory. Flying combat was incredibly dangerous. The average number of missions flown before being shot down was six. For these guys to keep going up, you know, on mission after mission, knowing that the next one could be their last, took a lot of bravery and a lot of guts. I got shot down on my eighth mission. I was up in the air, and two fuck wolves came in, and they shot the heck out of us. Remember they came in about one o'clock. They just made one pass, and everything blew up. Two of my men were killed in the plane. Two evaded capture. I was one of them, and my tail gunner was the other one. And then three of them got down safely, but they were picked up by the Germans, and they were interrogated and then they were marched out in the woods and shot in the back of the head. Three Belgian farmers saw the chute open and they came running over and they threw me a rope, pulled me up to the tree and got me out of the tree. And one of them took me off into the woods and hid me. They were different personalities, of course. Some of them were brave, some of them were scared to death. The ones that were scared of hiding you, why they, they moved me pretty quick. The ones that didn't uh, weren't scared, I mean, you might stay there six weeks. They risked not only their lives, but the lives of their family and friends. If the German secret police, the Gestapo, found out about it, they'd be arrested, tortured, and either sent to a concentration camp or shot. And some of the people that helped my dad and, and his other members of the crew met that fate. Word came that the Allies had landed at Normandy on June 6th. So he knew they'd be coming up through France to liberate that area. His Belgium helpers accompanied him over the Belgian border into France and joined up with a unit of the French resistance called the Mackie. They would disrupt communication, sabotage railroad lines, uh, attack convoys, assassinate German officers. And so he fought with them for uh, a couple months. 
the very first hours of the uh, 2nd of September 1944, few jeeps uh, of the reconnaissance party of the 60s infantry regiment crossed the border and there the Belgian population were waiting for, for the liberators. They were waiting that for four long years and uh, they saw the liberators coming in and uh, they were waving, they had uh, flowers. It was very uh, happy days for the old people of Belgium. Word came that there were uh, U.S. troops in a nearby village of Trelon, France. So he walked into the village, into the town square, up to an uh, army major. My dad identified himself, and that ended his seven months of missing in action. The Belgian people saw firsthand the atrocities committed by the Nazis. To this day, they are so grateful and so thankful still for the Americans coming to their rescue and liberating them from Nazi oppression. My father, Paul Delahaye, started the Belgian-American Foundation in 1984. It was for the 40th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium. The GIs who had been killed deserved the right to, to, uh, to be honored and to, to receive homage from us because they gave their life for, for us. Every year they have ceremonies at these various memorials that they've erected in the area on the anniversary date of those events. But the big celebrations are always on September 2nd, the anniversary date of the liberation of Belgium. Your father came the first time in 1988. I remember him when he came the, the, the first time because we were very young. So that was the Americans. We had never seen Americans, you know, so that was a bit crazy. In 1994, I took my first trip to Belgium uh, with my parents. There was an event. There were hundreds of people in this hall, and we were a little late arriving. My dad walked in, and the entire place stood up and started applauding. And it was really moving. You know, they treated him like he was the president of the United States. I can never forget it. And I got a whole new appreciation for my dad, because, you know, I knew these stories, but, you know, you hear the stories, but, you know, they're not that personal to you. But when you're there, and you're seeing these places where the events took place, they've been in rooms where my dad was hidden, thinking that he was right here. He climbed out this window to get up on this roof. I mean, the history is preserved right there. The locals really saved my dad's life. It's a war we fought together. He came here to liberate my country. Why wouldn't I help him? I corresponded with him from the time I got back to the States until he died. They're wonderful people. They're brave people. I mean, they risk their life to keep you from being captured. My parents had kept a lot of material from the war. There were two items that were really significant. One was a diary that my dad wrote while he was missing in action. And the other item were all the letters that my dad wrote to my mother during the war that she had kept. And sitting down one time, many several hours reading these letters, and I just became fascinated with the story of my dad and his crew, and it became my passion. I just came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that it needed to be told. People needed to hear about it, and so I decided to write a book. Shot Down focuses on one crew and what happened to each member of that crew. That it just makes for a fascinating story, one that hasn't been told. All that the U.S. military knew was that my dad's plane was shot down by two Falk Wolf German fighters, and I just assumed that's all I'd ever know. One day, during my research, my wife Glenda said, why don't you try to find the German pilot that shot him down? But like a good husband, I did what she told me to do, and I found Hans Berger. He's 95 years old now. He lives in Munich, Germany. Here's a picture of a Hans. Picture of... Well, that's pretty neat. That's your plane, your picture, yeah. and your autograph.
The young people of today, they have no idea what our life was, what the time was, what, uh, what difficulties we had, and that we were not all evil Nazis, but we were people like you and me, and uh, we just grew up in, in different spheres. On this 8th day of February, your father and me met, <laughs> and we shot each other down. <laughs> I've been asked several times, like, well, don't you hate this guy that shot down your dad's plane? But uh, no. Well, good for you. Keep... From the very get-go, I felt a personal relationship with Hans. He was 20 years old. He was fighting for his country, just trying to do a job and trying to stay alive. And World War II was the defining moment in my father's life. Really, I think it's the defining moment for any guy's life who fought in World War II. This... Yeah. And Hans is a part of my dad's life, a part of uh, his story. And so I had no ill feelings toward Hans, and uh, we become friends. Never thought that I'd meet the, the son of the guy I shot down. Yeah, well, I never oh, thought I'd meet you either. Incredible. <laughs>
<laughs> Maybe you wanted to go out on the high note. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, we lost Steve. Hopefully he'll pop back in here in a second. I'm not, I have no idea there. Uh, anybody have any any comments uh, on that? Any questions that they'd like to bring up? Uh, certainly Steve, is uh, when he, once he's back on, he's prepared to go a little deeper here and there. Uh, when I first read the book, uh, I was, wow, I, this is the first time I heard of someone being shot down Yes. Not, not captured, but then yes. fighting with the French resistance. That's the part that really caught my attention. I'm sure there must have been a few others, but not too many. I know. Lucky, are you familiar with others who shot down and fought with the resistance? Not to this degree. No, this is one of the best um, uh, depictions of, of what that was like. Uh, and, of course, I never experienced it myself, thankfully, uh, nor did I experience uh, being captured and living in POW camp. Um, those are aspects of the war that uh, I did not experience uh, firsthand. I was aware of them, of course, but um, uh, they weren't part of my repertoire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, fortunately. Fortunately, yes, yes, yes. I'm I'm curious about the three airmen who were captured, interrogated, and then shot. Yeah, that's also something I haven't heard much about. I I, I was going to ask Steve about that too, and hopefully he'll come back on here in a second. I it's been a couple of years since I read the book, so it's a little hazy in my mind. Um, one of the other aspects, because he covers each of the crewmen. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed, one of those crewmen's name, last name was Musial. Uh, that is Stan Musial's, the famous ba baseball player's nephew, <laughs> which uh, I always found kind of interesting with that connection. Has Steve popped back on yet? Steve has popped back on and Brad Washabaugh has his hand up. Hi, Brad. Hi. Hey, Lucky, thanks again for joining us tonight. I was uh, wondering if how you felt about the German pilots after the war and whether you had the chance to meet and converse with them and and uh, your attitude towards them after the war? Uh, yes, Brad, I have had a chance to uh, meet several, including Galad, uh, who was probably the leading uh, ace of um, uh, the, uh, the Luftwaffe. And um, uh, I, I hold no animosity toward them because I am appreciative of the fact that they were doing exactly what we were doing and that what we, was what we thought was right uh, to defend the cause that, um, that, that we were fighting for. And um, they were human beings just as we were, flesh and blood. And... Uh, the ones that I met uh, and and got to know were, uh, uh, of course, just like uh, you and me, and uh, that was a realization that we didn't have to um, acknowledge or to uh, experience during the war, but after the war we did, and that made all the difference. Yeah, thank you, Lucky. Uh, uh, Steve, you're back with us. Yeah, sorry about that. My internet went out. Ah, <laughs> well, uh, for about five minutes, we after uh, the the film stopped, uh, we had nothing but high praise for you, <laughs> your father, your effort to uh, uh, make this beautiful film about him, and what a great tribute it is to him and to all uh, the World War II generation, and particularly the Eighth Air Force. Well done. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Just, it's just not my about, and you know, my book's just not about my dad, but it's about each member of his crew and about all the courageous Belgian people that risked their lives to help him. And it's a tribute to the, all the men who served in the eighth, for, eighth Air Force and all the men who served in World War II. One, one of the first questions that came up was that three of your father's crew who were captured and then subsequently shot. Could you expand on that? What more do we know about that? Was that common uh, to be shot by the enemy after being captured? 
Yeah, uh, three of my dad's crew uh, evaded capture for a couple months, and they actually met up with uh, seven other downed airmen, um, five from uh, the, the uh, 306 B-17 Ration Passion, uh, one from the 303rd uh, Bomb Group, one from the 91st Bomb Group. At one time, there were eight of them uh, hiding in the woods outside of Chimay. And uh, if uh, do I have sharing on here? Here, let me make you a co-host so you could share. Okay. And the ten of them were hiding in a makeshift hut uh, that they erected with the help of some uh, Belgium uh, helpers. In the woods outside of Chimay, Belgium, which is right at the French French Belgium border. Uh, let me uh, see if I can share this here. Oops. Can you see this? Not yet, no. Okay. I must be doing something wrong here. I thought I shared this. Okay. Here we go. Uh, in a makeshift, uh, this is the location of the hut in the woods that put up now, which uh, they've marked it off. Sorry, it's taken a while. Uh, this is the location of the hut that's marked off now. There's a tribute to it there. Um, and this is what the hut looked like, basically, in shape. There were 10 of them hiding in this hut, and they were waiting to get in, into escape routes uh, to get down through uh, through France into Spain, you know, over the Pyrenees, and then out through uh, British control to Gibraltar. Uh, this is an, what the hut looked like. And we got this diagram from one of the guys that were hiding in the hut, Warren Cole, uh, tail gutter. Uh, on the ration passion and it was built into the ground as you can see the image on the left and the roof of the of the hut touched the ground and then inside the hut on the on the on the right it, they had a long bed where these guys could sleep at a table in it one entrance and this is a a uh, latrine that they they dug off to the side and they were waiting and they're trying to get out and just do escape routes and actually warren cole the guy that uh gave the information to this diagram and Ivan Glaze. They got tired of hiding and they they head out, uh, headed out on their own and they made it through the escape routes and got back to England. Uh, but the other eight guys uh, were waiting to get into escape routes. But before they could do that, a uh, Belgian collaborator, collaborator told uh, the Germans about it on April 21st of 44, uh, the hut was surrounded by hundreds of members of different uh, German and Nazi military police and army police groups. And they captured the eight airmen and they took them uh, into Chimay into a schoolhouse, uh, which is still there today. And they interrogated them. This is what the schoolhouse looks like. It hasn't changed at all in 80 years. And after they interrogated uh, them, well, let me show you one thing here. Still in that, still inside that schoolhouse, there's writing, German writing in one of the classrooms. It says today, the German shoulder with his act, German shoulder with his act, active participation will determine the fate of Europe. After they uh, interrogated him, they took him back out in the woods. And they shot all eight of them. There's a memorial there. Uh, they took them uh, back out in the woods. It was near where the hut was. And uh, they also arrested two young Belgian men who was helping them. They were sent to concentration camps, never to be heard from again. So it was a very tragic ending for those three of my dad's crew and uh, five other uh, U.S. airmen. Wow. Powerful. And, and they did a, uh, uh, they had a uh, war crimes commission 
uh, investigate this. Uh, they arrested uh, a number of Germans. Um, some of them escaped uh, from uh, kept, you know, after they were arrested. How that happened, I don't know. But in the, the bottom line, only one of them was uh, actually went to trial, was uh, convicted, and was hung. So my dad and the tail gunner, which he mentioned, this is a memorial there uh, in the location of where the eight men were murdered. Like I said in the video, uh, the Belgian people are wonderful people. Uh, that they're still so thankful. Then they have a uh, memorial that they built nearby to honor the eight men who were murdered and the two uh, Belgian men that were sent to concentration. Wow. So my dad's crew, um, two of them were killed in the plane. And then uh, the other eight bailed out. Uh, my dad and the tail gunner evaded capture. Unlike my dad that was moved from place to place to place, the tail gunner, Bill Schlinker, he spent the whole time with one family for seven months. But he, he was just 18 years old. He was a young guy. Uh, my dad was an old guy. He was 28 years old. He was moved from place to place. And then three of the crew were, uh, they were immediately captured uh, by the Germans and were became POWs. Although two of those men were so severely injured, one had his foot blown off and the other almost had his right bicep blown off that they were repatriated before the war ended and they were sent back to the U.S. in January of 1945. So something really kind of different happened to each member of the crew after they were attacked by the Falkwolf fighters. Now, I, I found the part about the two wounded airmen being uh, repatriated fascinating. It was something I had not read of before. And as I did a couple of years ago, but I haven't done, I promised myself that I'd in, uh, research that a bit and see if that must have happened to others as well. Uh, yes, there were, I forget off the top of my head now, there was a big exchange of prisoners uh, between the, because Switzerland was the protecting power and because they were they were neutral, and so they kind of brokered the deal where uh, German military personnel soldiers were sent back to Germany, and, and and then U.S. troops were sent back to the U.S. who were severely injured. Todd, uh, it's it's eight o'clock. Uh, do we need to stop for a station break? Do we need have other questions or nope? Go ahead, station break. Let me remind people that this is the Veterans Breakfast Club. We do this every week, twice a week. And sometimes it's about World War II, but other times it's about other subjects. We want to get every veteran who's ever served, any every branch of service, every era, to share their story with us. Uh, Monday night, we just had a, a really unforgettable program with veterans who served in graves registration in Vietnam. And boy, that has stuck with, I think, all of us hearing those stories. On Monday night, February 26th, we're going to have this man, Ian Fritz, on. He spent, uh, he, he spent uh, his time in the Army as a linguist, uh, speaking two different languages that are spoken in Afghanistan. He spent 600 hours listening to the Taliban uh, while he was in Afghanistan, and he learned quite a bit. He's going to share his story with us on Monday night. I also want to acknowledge our wonderful sponsors who support this programming both in person and online. One is Tobacco Free Adagio Health. Uh, tobacco Free is dedicated to preventing and reducing tobacco use, educating people about tobacco hazards, and advocating for healthier places to live, work, and play. You can find out more about what they do at tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. And you could also, if you're interested in helping somebody quit smoking, you could access their counseling line 1 800 Quit Now. That's 1 800 Quit Now. UPMC for Life is another sponsor that sponsors uh, our in-person events and also our podcasts and live streams like this one. UPMC for Life can help you make sense of Medicare. You can get the answers and information you need, such as how to choose a Medicare Advantage plan that's right for you. UPMC for Life has plans designed for veterans, by veterans, that could save you money and get you more benefits. You could check out your plan options by going to upmchealthplan.com slash Medicare. That's upmchealthplan.com slash Medicare. One of the things that we do is publish a magazine, a quarterly magazine, where we hear the stories 
uh, that are are shared on our programs, and we write them up in magazine form and publish them every quarter. This goes out to 17,000 people. Uh, we now send it out to, to 9,000 households, over 9,000 households, and then print out 7,000, 8,000 more for hand distribution. Uh, it is going to the printer this week. It, you should get it in your mailbox next week. Um, and let us know if you would like to subscribe. It's free of charge. You can just send me an email, todd at veteransbreakfastclub.org. Finally, we have a very quick, short survey. It takes two and a half minutes to fill out. What do you think of the program? What do you like or not like about it? How can we improve? I'm going to put the link in the chat here. We read these very closely, and um, we thank you for taking two and a half minutes to let us know what you think about these programs. All right, back to you, Glenn. Thank you, Todd. Uh, let, let's see, are there other questions of Steve Snyder from the audience or in the chat uh, about his father's experience, about uh, any aspect of, of the air war? You can, oh, here we have Don Patton. Hello, Don. Great, Don. Thank you for being with us. I got to tell you, Don is one of those people that has filled out the survey and we, he, Don talks, we listen. Yes. <laughs> Except we're not hearing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. If there's if there's no questions, one thing I'll, I'd like to comment on, you know, I've always wondered uh, why my dad decided to join the French resistance. You know, the smart thing for him to do and the safest thing for him to do was just to stay hunkered down and st uh, stay hidden and wait for the U.S. troop to come up and liberate the area. But he felt it was his duty to get back in the fight. Um, word came that the Allies landed, you know, at Normandy. And he felt that there were, you know, there were U.S. soldiers and uh, airmen and what have you fighting and dying for their country. And he felt it was his responsibility to get back into the fight. And that's why he joined the uh, resistance. His helpers tried to talk him out of it because he could have died fighting against the Germans. Or if they had captured him, they would have shot him on the spot as, as a terrorist or, or a spy. And he was quite taller than your average French or Belgian. I mean, if it, on the documentary, you could see how tall he was. Yeah, he was six foot three. So he was quite a bit taller than the, the local Belgian people. They had a tough time finding clothes that, uh, you know, to fit him because his pants were always too short for the ones that they put on him. You know, they stuck a beret on him to try to help him blend in. But there were several times where he was almost discovered by the, by the Germans that are described in, in, in the book, which are... Uh, but he, he finally got tired of hiding, you know, it, uh, it was pretty stressful, you know, being hidden. His plane was attacked. It was on fire. He has to bail out. He's in a foreign country, has no idea where he is, doesn't know what has happened to his buddies on the crew, can't communicate with the U.S. military, being helped by complete strangers. They can't communicate at the beginning because he couldn't speak French and they couldn't speak English. He learned how to speak conversational French later on. Um, and any one of those people that could help that were helping him out to be a collaborator. Yeah. Let's Don see, Patton, Don, you, yeah. you have unmuted. How are you, Don? I'm unmuted. Yes, sir. Um, the Steve, I, um, I've run the World War II History Roundtable in Minnesota. We're in our 37th year. And I have heard so many stories that uh, in my aging process, I can't remember them all. But... Uh, one thing that I'd like to uh, uh, let the people know, I, I wish I knew how many stories are out there. Uh, we had a, uh, a program, actually, we, we did two programs over about a 12-year period. A lady here by the name of Barbara Wolchik, and um, she had an uncle, and, and you, you could do a whole program about her story. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away with cancer about a year ago, but she wrote a book called Bud's Jacket. And uh, it, it's an unbelievable story. He was in the, um, her her uncle was in the 305, I think it was, 
was in the 305th uh, bombing the Lorient sub pins. And uh, uh, th they did much of what Steve did. Um, th the family had been kind of divided, won't go into that story, but the, the family came together. They actually went over, uh, they went to the crash site, uh, the French folks there in that area had uh, put up a monument. <clears throat> and uh, when we, when I took the round table trip there five years ago, we actually went to the, to the crash site, to the monument site. Uh, th there must've been 40 uh, French civilians that came out. They played the French national anthem, the U S al national al album. Uh, we, we had about 28, I think it was, in our tour. They arranged to have a rose for each of our uh, American tourists, uh, which they asked us to lay at this monument uh, outside of Lorient. But uh, uh, the, what the family did, uh, they, they mashed in, and, and there were actually two of the people that helped the... Uh, uh, the survivors of the crash. And, and again, I don't remember, uh, it, it was similar to Steve's. There were some that were killed in the crash, some that were uh, uh, survived, uh, some were captured. Uh, but um, the, the thing that the French people did with them, and, and as I recall, the number was 56 safe sites to take them from uh, this area near Lorient, uh, France down to the Pyrenees, uh, across into Spain. And uh, if uh, I, I highly recommend the book Bud's Jacket, uh, if, if you go to our webpage. And, that... and Don, I'll interrupt you and just say I've put a link to Bud's Jacket here in the Zoom chat. Uh, if people want to order the book, it sounds like a totally fascinating story. Thank you very much, Don. I think we'll have, you better bring another suitcase when you come out to see us. We may have a suitcase of books for you to take. But. <laughs> Very good, Don. Yes, I'm headed out there next month to see you. Thank you, Don. Joe, I know that you had a question here, I think for Lucky and Steve. You put it in the chat. I did. How, yeah. how did you escape from a B-17? I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, that uh, in, in Masters of the Air, which I, I, I'm glad you guys talked about its authenticity because it sure seems that way, and I'm really happy that it is. Um, I don't understand. I know some of the guys, Rick Weber, I'll put him on the spot because he uh, made a practice of jumping out of these silly things up in the air. Uh, I don't understand how in the world did so many of these guys make it out of those burning B-17s or at 25,000, 30,000 feet, the dang thing is burning, blowing up. You know, and I, I just, you know, anybody who can, you know, shed some light on that, I'd sure appreciate it because I don't know how they did it. Well, they, 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 it was either jump out of the plane or, or, or be killed in it, you know. When your life is on the line, you find a way to do it. Unfortunately, many of them did not make it out of the plane because of the centrifugal forces that are built up or they were committed and couldn't make it out. Here's a question along the same lines, Joe, uh, of Steve or Lucky, if, I, if Lucky is still there. I'm not sure I don't see him. Um, uh, I've heard a, a couple of podcasts that said that the 8th Air Force Airmen were not trained in parachute jumping that when they had to jump out, that was the first time they ever jumped out of an airplane with a parachute. Is it Steve, can you yeah. talk about that? that? That is correct, yeah. yeah. I'm looking, they, I, they, they, they that's had amazing. Class, they had classroom, you know, training where they said, well, this is what you do, but they never actually did it until they had to do it uh, when they were on a mission. Yeah, and, I mean, and I'm looking, another, another, another thing about it is that because it's so cramped in a P-17, they didn't wear their parachutes. I mean, they, they had to have the wits about them to begin with to find their parachute and, and uh, clip it on hooks on the back of the parachute harness before they could even bail out. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. When I heard that point, in fact, it was made by Don Miller in a podcast. It just blew my mind that 
<laughs> that, that wouldn't have been part of training. I'm looking at a guy right now, Rick Weber, who is trained in parachuting. And I bet uh, you can't imagine what it must be like. I mean, it's hard, I think, to parachute out of a perfectly good plane, but one that's going down and on fire and you've never done it before, Rick. I don't know how people do that. Well, <clears throat> I have a comment for Joe. I actually have three comments. <laughs> um, to answer your question, uh, first of all, when you're talking about World War II, guys, you're talking about the greatest generation. Amen. You're talking about pilots. Steve Dads was a minor exception because he was 28. Lucky hit. He said he was hit. He was the he hit the 21. He was the 21 year old pilot, and he was also a director of flights. And so that was the reason young people don't fear. And the other factor is. Officers were well-trained, and they never showed that they were worried or nervous. You can't do that with other guys. Uh, I have stopped watching Masters of the Air because every time I watch it, I see so many planes get on, and it just tears me up. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking a crew of 10, uh, obviously I'm a ground pounder. You lose guys, but you're losing one here, two there, three there. You're not losing crews. And when I heard and saw some of these planes go down, the numbers are just staggering, just absolutely staggering. And you say, now, not everyone is killed, but still captured, wounded. Um, those numbers are horrific. And I, and I applaud these guys because they did it every day. Every day they could fly, they went up because one, they were trained, two, they were young, and they didn't think they'd be next. Um, and that's that's the secret to young people. Is you, uh, Joe asked Lucky um, how he did it. And he said, I don't know how I did it because I guarantee he wouldn't be doing it now at his age or anyone that's our age can't do these things. Well, you know, Rick, if I could mention last week's program with uh, Robert Matson and the Jimmy Stewart story, you know, Jimmy Stewart was in his mid 30s when he was flying these bomber missions as a squadron commander. And he had, you know, one reason he did have problems, uh, according to Robert Matson, was his age. He's 35, and these other kids are 21 and 22. The stamina and that mental or emotional state has got to be different for a mid thirty year old. We're not hearing Rick. Oh, that's because I I I uh, muted him. <laughs> <laughs> so I I took a picture. We took pictures at your um, presentation in Jan in January for Ed's birthday, and I have a picture of. You had him up on the screen of Jimmy Stewart at age, I believe, 19, it was 1941. 42. And then 1942. And 42. then three or four years later, it was just incredible the difference, how much he aged. Yeah. I've showed it to people and they go, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I believe that because you're young, you're invincible. I, I thank you, Joe. I hope that answers your question. But yeah, uh, jumping out of an airplane is not that difficult, especially if it's on fire. I guarantee you're going to get out. <laughs> um, but I, I it, you know, I, I always people say, how many jumps did I have? I said, I only had one jump. I had a lot of throws and pushes, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's. Everybody has their own thing. And uh, I, I have so much respect for pilots. Um, and, and also I know this is another generation, but, uh, World War II bomber pilots, bombers, particularly fighter pilots in Vietnam, um, you have helicopters going down left and right, and there was crews of four and, um, they, that was tough. So I, I applaud them. I think that everyone has their own job to do and everybody does it the best of their ability. And so I salute these gentlemen because they are terrific, just as I do all World War II. 
Thank you. So Mayor. thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, you're doing a terrific job, man. I, I really. It's easy when you got people like Steve and Lucky to talk to. Oh, yeah. Well, that's for sure. And Steve, Colin's I... great. Colin is great, too. And Colin. And Colin's yeah. going to be featured next, next week. So. Steve, I have a question if there's no other questions to pose. Real quick one. Was your father, your father was already married at, at this point in time? Yeah, three of his crew were married, but he was the only one that had a, a child. Yes, you know, the plane was named Susan Ruth after his one-year-old daughter. So during that seven-month period or so when he's missing in action, what did the family know? And do you know, do you have any uh, uh, recollections from your mother as to what was happening in the States and her thoughts? Well, they were shut down on February 8th. And on February 23rd, she got a telegram from the War Department saying that he was missing in action. And uh, there's a lot of excerpts in the books uh, from letters that were exchanged between mothers, wives, sweethearts that, you know, are very moving and personal about, you know, their, their basically belief in God and, and hope and prayer that their loved one would, would, would come back home. And then my other sister, Nancy, was born while my dad was missing in action. Wow. My mother not only had one-year-old Susan, but baby Nancy, um, not knowing if she'd ever see her husband again. And she knew nothing until uh, he got back to England um, in the middle of September. And then he sent her a uh, Western Union telegram saying he was back at base and that it's a fiddle. So that was a glorious day for my for my my mother and uh, uh, his his my dad's parents and uh, all the relatives. It's the other part of this whole story that we don't often touch on, and that's the agony that the families went through waiting to hear what happened to their loved ones. Um, and the guys that were pres prisoners of war, you know, they could correspond back, so they knew that they were safe. And then they found out that the two airmen, or the Baltaric gunner and the radio operator, were killed in the plane. But they didn't know what happened to the other five seen in action. And actually, they didn't find out definitely what happened to all those guys in the hut for uh, a year after the war ended. Yeah. And it was just because uh, the co-pilot, co uh, George Ike's uh, father, went to uh, his senator and they ended up doing a war crimes uh, investigation where they have actually found out that these eight guys were were murdered and buried in a common grave in Belgium, and then the you know the graves registration you know dug them up and they, they identified them. Four of the guys in the shot down story are buried in Margraten in the Netherlands, and my dad Walter Gunner is buried at uh, the Ardennes American Cemetery in Belgium. Steve, to the best of your knowledge, did your father suffer from any survivor's guilt? Not that I know of. Um, he did suffer from PTSD when uh, shortly after he came back. I never noticed he had gotten over by the time I was born. But yeah, but my aunt told me that my dad and my mother, you know, I had some rough times when he first came back because he had these two little needy baby girls and, you know, you know, coming from this in action and fighting with the resistance, you know. He just wasn't in that frame of mind. One night, actually, I, my mother told me that my dad started strangling her in the middle of the night. She had the uh, Howard, Howard, Howard. And so, yeah, he, but uh, I I don't know about survivors. He did, uh, the five guys that made it, they did get together now and then and play cards and they had reunions. Uh, and I met him when I was, Yeah. Other uh, thought? We're getting towards the end. Uh, can we get anybody else's question in? Let's see. Anybody else have a question here? Um, oh, someone's know. waving their hand there. Oh, 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 hold on. Mike? Mike Prentice? Yeah, here we go. A 306 member. Mike. Great. 
Thanks for uh, joining us, Mike. We're we're trying to get you to unmute. There we okay. Here we go. You got to unmute, Mike, so we can hear you. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Yes. Uh, my dad was a navigator in the 306, uh, along with Steve's dad. And we also have Sue Moyer, I think, in the group tonight. And her dad was a gunner in the 306. So we're well, you know, we're, we're covered tonight. Uh, there's lots of stories I could tell. Uh, the last one, I guess you guys were talking about parachuting and the training. And I asked my dad about that. He lived to be 93, died in 2012. Um, and I, he said, we, they told us how to put the chute on, where the ripcord was. You jump, you count to 10, and that's it. That was the training they got. And one of the guys, they were, he was shot down on the second Schweinfurt raid. And five of his crew lived and five died. One of the guys refused to jump. Another one stood in the doorway and pulled the ripcord while he was in the plane. And the chute opened and hooked over the tail of the plane, and he went down hanging on the plane. Oh. So there's a million stories out there. That's just that's just one of them. And your dad flew on the the, Reagan, the uh, Schweinfurt Regensburg raid too, right? Right. Yeah. He flew all of the Black Week missions. And Sue, if, if you unmute, I don't know if your dad flew every one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad, every one of the, the missions so far in the uh, Masters of the Air, my dad has flew on. And the first one was the Regensburg Schweinfurt mission. And the 306 went to Schweinfurt. And my dad came back, they came back on two engines and 50 gallons of fuel and had to land at another base. And obviously their plane was pretty well shot up. Uh, he flew the other ones and that mission was kind of screwed up from the start. And then the Schweinfurt mission on October 14th was kind of screwed up also. That mission probably should have been aborted, but it was not. And so five of his crew lived, five died. And on the, the second Schweinfurt mission, 10 of the 15 B-17s of the 306 were lost. Yes, there oh. were only five, only five that made it to Schweinfurt. And um, my dad, they never got to Schweinfurt. He and the plane next to him in formation were shot down over Belgium, never got, never got to uh, Schweinfurt. And all he ever said was, they knew we were coming. Mm. Thank you for sharing with that. That's thank you. For did, you on, did your dad fly all the Black Week missions? I'm sorry, was that for me? Yeah. yeah. Were all, were your, was your dad on all of the Black Week missions? Uh, he did not go to um, Munster. He was on Bremen and um, Marienburg, and he was severely wounded on Second Schweinfurt. He went to the First Schweinfurt also. Um, he did have some survivors. He he never flew again. Um, he was in the hospital, and his crew was shot down shortly after the Second Schweinfurt. And I didn't know a lot of or understood a lot of this until, you know, I delved into it more frequently, but he always said he left them down. He, and he, I couldn't understand that, but what it was is he felt that he needed to be with the crew to help them through their POW experience. Right. And one thing we learned on this Frankfurt, second Frankfurt was um, uh, how about 30 years ago, a man named George Schaefer contacted the president at that point and said, um, you know, we know you have a, a memorial association, the Second Schweinfurt Memorial Association, which was started by survivors and headed up by Bud Peasley, who was the mission commander uh, from the 384th. He had gone to mission command. And he said, I, I'd like to come to one of your reunions. And they didn't really get the connection. But George Schaefer was the grandson of uh, the Schaefer family who started the ball bearings industry in Schweinfurt. And he was what was called a flak boy. Um, 
the flag towers that were shooting were even younger than the 18 year old pilots. They were uh, in school and whenever they knew a mission was coming, they had been trained younger ones as, as young as eight or nine were taught to do some of the mathematical calculations to man guns. And then the kids who were what we would say middle school today, younger teens would help with the one or two German soldiers who manned the flat guns. So these were younger boys, even than our fathers, and they felt a need for reconciliation and to share why they did and what they did with us. And in the city of Schweinfurt is a memorial. It's a joint memorial uh, between the two. And um, it, friends by choice is the bottom line on that one. And it's sort of like uh, Steve meeting with the man who shot down his dad. And, and it's, it's mutual respect. And we learned a lot more about the flack from them. And they even had more remorse probably because they were more victims than anything else. They had to do what they did. And, oh, I'm sorry. I have to say hi to Lucky. You so on, Lucky? I think he dropped off. I haven't yeah. seen oh, him in okay. 15 minutes. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Well, I think it's about 8.30, Todd. Should we uh Yeah, let's that? wrap it up. And I just want to let people know that, Glenn, you are going to be leading a tour, a Masters of the Air tour in England in September. People are welcome to join us. They could go to our website, veteransbreakfastclub.org slash travel to find out more about the information on the trip. Uh, it looks like a, a wonderful trip. We'll be talking more about it in the coming weeks. So thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Steve Snyder, so much. Thank you to Colin and Lucky Luckadoo. Thanks to all of you for being part of this wonderful conversation. I look forward to uh, continuing it next week. And next week will be Colin Heaton and Marilyn Walton. Marilyn is, uh, I think, uh, one of the preeminent experts on the POW experience. And That's Colin, right. so far, I haven't found anything that you're not an expert on relative to the air war. So we welcome your, <laughs> your always awesome. being with us. We appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, you, Colin. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Good night, and uh, hope to see you next week. Thanks Have a good watching. week.